Um, so uh, a lot of stuff in the new rendering pipelines is kind of based around like high definition, very physical, um, you know, real reality based shading. And I think one of the things that that kind of glosses over is the fact that you can actually also use that same pipeline to create non-realistic or non-photorealistic stuff, which is cool because, um, uh, because you know, you can create more stylistic things, more artistic things. So um, you've probably heard of a shell, cell shader, a tune shader before, but there's actually, it's not just one thing. There's a lot of ways that you can take uh, something that's, that's playing with light. And I just wanted to look at that a little bit. And I know that shaders are something that a lot of people kind of try to avoid. Um, but I like to kind of uh, talk about them because they're not as scary as they, uh, as they seem. And, um, you know, typing it out by hand is a little bit archaic, but, um, but with shader graph, which is in all the current versions of Unity, even though it's still in preview, it's becoming more and more robust. So you can actually just build this stuff. You don't need any special tools. You don't have to buy any uh, assets. You can just build this stuff um, visually in like a graph node editor. So I'm gonna use shader graph to build this, although I would also probably just code it by hand depending on what I wanted to do. Um, but anyway, so uh, Zelda is the classic example. They started doing cell shading in Wind Waker. They started doing some more advanced effects uh, in uh, Breath of the Wild, but it's obviously there's a lot of stuff that uses cell shading, not just games. Um, and the basic idea is that with normal shading or uh, with the normal attenuation of light, you have a soft fade from light to shadow. So that's pretty obvious. Um, with cell shading, what you're trying to do is create essentially a threshold where you say your light and then for the rest of it, you say, no, you're not light. You're just in shadow. So you don't blend at all or you blend very um, in steps or in discrete phases. So you call that banding or cell shading. Um, so the, here's one with two bands. Here's one with four bands. The cool thing is that you can control exactly um, where that threshold occurs and what the threshold looks like and um, and even the colors of those thresholds and so on. So we're going to kind of look at a simple version and then get uh, into like how you can modify it to, to look, you know, how you want it to look. So anyway, it's about creating these discrete steps in the light and in the shadow. All right. So first of all, here's what we'll build. This is the easy version, but it's not going to be as scary as it looks. I promise. Each of these are broken into sections and they all just handle little pieces of math. And the math isn't that scary either. The math is basically all based around one thing, which is the dot product. So this thing always confused me in school. I don't know if you ever had to do all this stuff with like matrix max math and stuff, but the dot product was always something that just, the name didn't really make sense, first of all, and <laughs> the notation didn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, but then when I started using it in, vi in a visual way and getting actual results um, graphically, it started to make a lot of sense. And it's pretty easy and it's really just comparing two angles. So it compares two angles, or in the case of Unity, it could be really useful. It's very helpful for me to remember that. You could think of those as directions, not just angles, because it could be a vector. Um, so think about it as two directions or uh, two angles, uh, and then it gives you one result. So the input is two angles. So it's like a comparison, a direct comparison. And then the output is always from negative one to one. So if you look at this little chart, it works like this. If it's negative one, they're pointing at each other. And that kind of makes sense. If they're negative, they're like in opposition, they're against each other, right? And if they're positive, they're both going the same way, they agree. Uh, and if they're zero, they don't care anything about each other and they're both going in, you know, they'll never meet. <laughs> so it kind of makes sense if you think about these angles as personalities, yep. So anyway, um, so if you look at the math for the dot product, I was like, uh, no. So, but there's already a dot product uh, node in shader graph, so we don't have to do anything about that. So cool. Uh, and then we're going to add more stuff. So that's the end of my presentation slides. Now we get to build stuff. <laughs> so here is a sample scene, uh, really simply here. And here is the base cell shader that we're going to create. Um, and this shader out of the box already has some things that we can modify about it, which is cool. So if we uh, look at this scene, I'll just play it so we can kind of take a look at simple objects and more complicated objects and how they um, react to the light. Um, so I'm going to start with actually, sorry, I'm going to start with not maximizing this because I want to be able to zoom around. All right, so with a simple object, with a sphere, you know, if you rotate the sphere, you're not going to get much 
<laughs> much different. So I have some different objects here to show kind of the different uh, ways that objects will react to light. So here we have a standard boring sphere, and this has standard unity shader for standard lighting. So it just fades, uh, it attenuates or it fades from light to dark. It has a little specular shine. It has a shadow. That's it. It's what you get. Okay. What we're going to do is try to create something more like this. This is the same thing. It's just a single color. Uh, it has a specular highlight. It has the cell banding though, and you'll see it also has some other things. It has a rim light, it has a shadow, and it doesn't drop to full black like Unity Standard Shader does, which is not a great look actually, dropping to complete black, because usually there's ambient light. So this actually includes ambient light. And the best part about this is um, we have a direction light here, and this is not just frozen in uh, like a texture. So a lot of um, tune shading was, was faked, uh, like Wind Waker, a lot of that is faked, um, and you kind of just bake it into the object. Um, in this shader, it actually is reacting to environment light um, and even uh, using the calculations from the light's color and using the calculations from ambient light. So it will actually add all that to the student shader uh, and in the spec and all that stuff. So it's pretty cool. Um, so it'll still work even if the light's very dim and uh, it'll still work, you know, whatever. But you can kind of see that um, this is just a directional light. So I'm not worried about where the light is positioned. Um, right now, I'm just thinking about the direction. So that is where we're going to get that angle, that direction that we're going to use in the dot product. So if I look at a more complicated object, you can see that here. Um, you can see as I move the object around, it will um, that specularity is part of that banding, um, and it will split up in kind of that cell shaded or cartoon-like look. Uh, we can add a texture to it, and the same thing will still happen. We'll just also be blending it with the texture. If you look at this with a more complicated object, like an animated character, you'll see here it is with the standard Unity shader, or just no shader, uh, you know, just what comes out of the box. And then here it is with the cell shader, and you can see what the, the difference is there. So this is more of that kind of wind waker of look. Uh, so that's what we're going to make. Let's take a look at it. So here's the idea. If you've never used Shader Graph, uh, you can just go to your package manager and install it, um, whatever the most current version is. And it's just in there. It's called Shader Graph. There it is. And uh, once you load it up, you can open up a Shader Graph window, and it looks like this. So node-based editor. It's actually pretty simple. It's pretty clean. It's just uh, you can click around, drag the screen, and you can right click and create nodes. And they have all these nodes that they've created for you. So it's pretty uh, pretty simple. If you've ever used any of the asset source stuff like Amplify, it's a lot, it's a lot more simple than those. Um, and, but it's free, so hey. <laughs> yes. So this is um, current, most current 2018. But you could do this on 2019. Uh, but for Shader Graph, it has to be 2018 or up. Um, yeah, that, they just introduced Shader Graph today. Yeah. 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 There's some tweaks, and we can go over that. If you have any questions, if you're rebuilding in 2019, you totally can. Um, there's there's basically like the math is all going to be the same and the math is pretty simple. It's like multiplying and adding stuff. So don't, don't worry about it. I don't like math either. Um, <laughs> okay, so so here we go. Um, it's pretty simple. The layout is just you have the working area, you have an, uh, a preview area, and then you have properties. The, these guys here, these little properties, are things that will appear in your inspector window that people can actually change. So if I look at my... Uh, grass, cell shader, you can see those are these things here. Those are those things in this properties panel. So that's it. So here's how we'll do it. First of all, um, we want to create the simplest version of this. And so we're going to basically strip this down, strip it back to something super simple, rip all this stuff out and recreate it. Okay. So the first thing is that when you create a new shader, you get a master node. You get this for free. It just comes in here. So here's a PBR master. It's just a physically based uh, rendering system. It's just Unity's regular rendering system. And you get different kinds of inputs. You get all the things that you usually see 
um, when you're when you're making a texture. Um, but because that we're actually hijacking the lighting system, we don't care about Unity's lighting. We're not uh, using their Albedo because they're using all their own lighting calculations, and we don't need it because we're actually recreating the light system. So we're going to just plug everything straight into a mission, and that's the first trick here. So a, a mission is is the channel that um, lights up stuff, uh, usually in addition to the main channel. But we don't need the main channel. We're ignoring it. So we're just ch changing the main channel all the way to black because we're ignoring it. And we're plugging all of our stuff into the emission. So that's that's kind of trick number one for doing tune shading or anything where you're, cr you're controlling the light yourself. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, take a look at this area here um, because this is kind of where it starts. Sorry, here. First of all, we want to be able to have a texture on our object. So in our, our sample, we have this rock texture. But we want to be able to add a, a texture, not just have a single color. So we've created a texture here. And I'm going to actually kind of side by side this. I'm going to recreate this. Um, but uh, stay with me. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Pretty good, pretty easy. All right, so I'm going to create a new one. So if you go to your hierarchy or you go to your folder, you go to create a new object. You can go to create shader. And in the newer versions of Unity, you'll see under their standard shaders, which will give you, um, which will take you to, you know, a text editor. Um, under those, you'll have these ones that say graph. And those are for the shader graph. So you have a PBR graph, a subgraph, and an unlit graph. So PBR graph is just the regular graph. So we're just going to grab that. Regular graph, and we'll call this cell demo, whatever you want to call it. And then what you'll notice is when you create one of these graph ones and click on it, it it'll say open shader editor instead of open in code or whatever. So if you click on that, then it'll pop it into our shader editor. And so now we have our cell demo here. And we also have our original one. We'll open them both so we can play along here. Um, OK, great. There it is. OK, so the first thing you'll see is that master node we talked about. And you'll also see that we've got no properties. I'll just move that over here so you can see it. But there's nothing. There's just, just a blank slate. And it's that blank, super boring one. So first thing we need to do is we're not going to use the albedo. So like I said, we'll turn that to black. And we're going to use the emission. So we need to plug something into here. And uh, for a node-based thing, um, you know, you're just going to be creating nodes and then dragging and dragging and linking them together. That's how this whole thing works. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to get the main color or the main texture of the object. And we need to plug it in here. So we're going to do that. So if you create a node, you can also just press the space bar and start typing. Uh, you can do texture. And you can see that there's a sample texture right there. So here's our texture. And we're just going to grab the output and plug it into emission. So that's like the one of the simplest textures you could have. Um, now we can pick a, a texture right here. It could be, you know, whatever. So here's uh, some wood, and we have a thing. And now we have um, a, uh, a self-lit. That's essentially what emission means. It's a self-lit object that has this texture. Now, what if we don't want every object to have this bookcase texture? That's when we use the properties. So if you just click the plus here, you get these different properties. So we need a texture. And we'll just call it, you know, main texture. Sure, fine. Uh, pretty easy. And then you can always rename these by double clicking on them. So it makes it pretty easy. But if we just say main texture, and then um, I can pick a default, which could be that bookcase or soccer ball or whatever, it doesn't matter. I can take this property and I can drag it into the, into the uh, graph, which is really useful. So now I have a property and I can drag it in there. And now this property here is going to feed this texture, and then that's going to go to the emission. So this is a little bit annoying, but you have to click Save Asset every time you want it to compile. So if you don't, if you're not seeing updates, that's why you just got to click Save Asset. So now that we have this, um, we can. It's done. It's a, it's a finished shader, and now all you have to do is you can say, okay, I'm going to um, create a object here, and I'll call it or a material, and I'll call it demo. And then for that, you just find where your shader was. So if you're wondering where the shader was, it by default puts them in shader graphs. But that's this little property right here. If you double click on that, you can change it. So I can just call that 
cell shading or something. And then when I try to add a shader to my material, it'll appear there. So, oh yeah, it'll appear there after I click compile. Like I was just saying. And there, so now I save it, it'll appear. And I spelled it wrong, so it appeared over here. <laughs> okay, so there we go. So now you can see um, the property that we exposed for the person who's making it, main texture, appears just like we wrote it. They can choose the texture now, and they can change that texture whenever they want. And now it's, it's working just like a normal shader. So this is really cool because we can expose things we want to show to people, and then we can use them just by dragging and dropping them into the graph. So that's how it starts, really simply. But now we need to get the light because um, right now it's just going to be always the same lighting. It doesn't matter what you do to the light. It's just going to be fully bright because there's no lighting information in here. So time to add light and it's time to get that um, dot product that we're talking about. So essentially to get the light to the object, that's kind of how this is. So that was our texture right there, right? We need to go back here. Boop, 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 boop. Um, we need to go back to the actual normal of the object. So that's like where the object's facing. And then we need to um, get the direction of the light, the main light source in your scene, right? And those are gonna be our two angles. So the first angle is where the light is, and the second angle is where the object's facing, or the surface of the object, right? So we look at those two angles, and we get the dot product of them. That tells us the difference between those two, and then we know how bright it has to be. Right, so if the difference is really strong, then it should be darker, right? And if it's the same, it should be super bright and because it's pointing right back at your eye, it's like reflecting it in a mirror, ah, right, like that. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna get the dot product of the direction of the main light and the, the normal of your uh, object. So it's pretty simple. If you just press space again, you can just type normal. We need to get a normal vector because the vector is the angle or the direction. It can be in world space because um, that's it's in the world, so that's good. And then we need a uh, the dot product. Might as well get that up. Because so we're going to need to do this. So we're going to get the dot product of that and the light. So we have the main light here, and we have some different outputs here. So I have the direction of the main light. I'm going to plug that here, and we have the normal vector, and we're going to plug that there. But um, just to make sure we don't. Uh, we don't, um, because this is a vector and it might actually have a different length than one, it could be like this far or this far, we're just gonna normalize it. So we're gonna, anytime you have like a vector, because this one's just an angle, just the direction, it's just an angle, and we want this one to just be an angle, but right now it's a vector, it's an angle plus a thing. So we don't want the thing. So you just normalize it and now it's just an angle again. So now that it's just an angle again, now we can plug those two together and now instantly we're seeing light. So we're seeing that there's some direction here. So now, this is the basic idea. So if you've followed me this far, the rest of this won't be hard. <laughs> okay, I know, but have you followed me this far? <laughs> so it's pretty simple. What we're gonna do is we're gonna make tiny little pieces like this, like here's the light, cool. And then here's the texture, cool. And we're gonna combine them together. And we're gonna combine them together and then spit that, what we just combined, out into the output of the emission. And we're gonna keep doing that and keep doing that and it's gonna look more complex and grow out this way more, but it's actually all gonna just funnel to the same thing. It, we're just gonna be combining one more piece of information, one more piece of information. And that's why it's not too bad. So what we need to do is just multiply these together. So yeah, math, but it's not that bad math. So, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of math that I like. Um, so we're saying here's the texture, and then on top of that, add the light. So we multiply the light in, and now we get light with texture. Cool. And now we put that into the emission, and now we have a lit object with a texture. Now it's not going to be super fancy lighting yet, but it is a lit object with a texture. So we'll save that. Bling. And then we'll take a look at what we got. So. I'm going to add this to one of our one of our objects here. So we had our uh, our boring object here. So we're going to make this guy a little bit better and add that texture that we created. So we created a texture that was the demo cell. Uh, there it is. Great. Okay. So now with our demo cell, 
we can choose a texture. We can choose that soccer texture. Or we can choose another one. It's up to us because we made it, we exposed it. And then we can also, um, there we go. We can also change the lighting and it reacts to the lighting. So now we're getting what is essentially the original computer graphic lighting. This is like a Blin Fong lighting, super boring. It, it's lit and it has a texture, but there's basically nothing else exciting about it. It's not a cell shaded texture yet. It's just working kind of like it was before, but we got a texture. But the important thing is we built it ourselves. So now we're controlling that light, which is something that Unity doesn't do out of the box. So this is cool because now we can modify the light. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this light output and we're gonna screw with it um, because we don't want it to output this nice smooth thing. We want it to be in, in discrete steps. So what's really cool is there's a couple of ways that we can do that. This is the easiest. We take that thing that we just created and we use a step function. So a step function does exactly what we want it to do. It just takes steps and it basically says, if you're over this, then you know, I'll just cut you out. So what we're gonna do is when you when you have a step function, you see it has an in and an edge. So it's a little bit counterintuitive. The input is actually the below one. And then the edge is the cutoff or the threshold. So if I say 0.3, um, and that's, you can actually just type in values if you don't want them to change later, you can just type them in. Um, so I can just type in like 0.3 or 0.4 or 0.5, and you can see that I'll get my, my cutoff right there with the light. Now, if I plug that in to my multiply, I'm gonna get that harsh two, uh, two cell shaded lighting. So now I can create another property out here um, and I can just say, this is the step. I would probably come up with a better name. And the default can be, you know, 0.3. And then I'll save that. And now if I look at my object, um, now I see that really harsh shadow and it's starting to look cell shaded. Now it doesn't look good though, <laughs> but it's, it's definitely cell shaded. And what's really cool is we got that sharp, sharp, harsh edge. So now it looks a little bit more like, you know, like a drawing or something like that. Now, the cool thing about this is if I go in here, I gave myself a step, which is actually, this is the threshold. I guess I could have just called it that. And um, I can modify the, uh, the step of the object. So if I put this to, you know, one or point, maybe six. Um, oh, did we plug in that step or not? No, we didn't. We just made it. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so I step, I plug, drag that property out, plug it in and then save the asset. Uh, and then now when we modify this step, um, it's modifying how much, uh, or where the cutoff for the shadow is. So if you always want it to be kind of a, you know, on the edge, now you're going to have that threshold for your shadow. So it's really cool because we're already sort of art directing how our light works and how our shadow works. But it's also a little bit weird because it just looks like a hamster ball with like a half and a half. So we need to create a little bit more uh, steps. And also we want the cell shading, but this is a little bit harsh. I mean, that's it's a really harsh shadow. So what we're going to try to do is soften that shadow a little bit. So there's actually a, a function that does that a little bit better. And guess what it's called? It's called smooth step. So nothing too surprising about what this one does. It has an input, but this time it has two values. It has two edges. So let's say that step is our first value. Get rid of this, we don't need it anymore. Um, and we're gonna put the output of smooth step into our multiply now. All right, great. And then we need another step uh, because we need the second value. So here we go, we'll put this step two, or I mean, I could give these better names. Those are pretty bad names. And the default here can be 0.5, something bigger than 0.3. I will remember to drag it in this time. Okay, so now what we're doing is we're doing the exact same thing as before, except for this time it's saying, do that, but at the edge of where that is, blend between these two values. So instead of just going like on off, it's going, 
you're on and then you do like a slow little fade or a little gradient between the, you know, the two things that you typed in. So it'll just be like a little one, but the cool thing is we can control it. So now we get, we get that line, but see it's less harsh. And the cool thing about uh, that is that we can control exactly how harsh it is. So if we say 0.2 there and 0.3 here, then you can see that that's the, uh, click off of something here. There you go. Then you can see that that's that shadow, but the shadow's now got a little bit of a soft edge on it. And so you can decide kind of how crisp you want that edge to be. So that's cool. That gets us halfway there. Now we could keep doing that. We could keep creating step functions and keep creating smooth step functions, and we could layer a couple of them together, and then we would get more than one edge. So we could create uh, a couple of different you know, a couple of different cells. So that's cool. So we could totally do that. We could take smooth step again and we could do that. And we could say, well, this time, you know, you're going to have different values. You'll go from 0.5 to 0.6. And then we'll take this output as the input, right? Same thing. So it's, I'm doing the exact same thing. I'm just changing the values a little bit. And then I can multiply that and this together. So then I'm saying, okay, well, there's one and there's one and I can multiply this together and I can multiply this together. And now I'll get some different values and I can start to layer those together. But that's annoying because if we want 10 layers or something, we probably don't, but say we want five layers and I have to make all these different smooth steps and then I have to control all those values. So there's a better way. We can do this with a little texture and that tiny little texture can tell us exactly how we want to do it. And it's visual, which I like. Um, and that's called a ramp texture. So we're going to just draw a tiny little texture that's going to tell us where we want the light to go. And then we'll read that texture and use that instead of using these step functions. So the step function is like the original super simple uber easy way. Um, but it doesn't, it, it isn't that easy to control. And then you have to keep layering it up. So rather than doing that, what we're going to do is this. So you can see we created that step one, we created the smooth step one, but we're going to graduate from those and use this. So this is pretty simple actually. We're just gonna use another little texture. So we have the sample texture here, and then we're gonna add it to this vector here, and I'll show you what that does. So now we have our dot product, okay? And we are multiplying it by 0.5, and then we're adding 0.5 to it. And why we're doing that is because we're going to be reading from this texture, but the dot product gives us negative one to one, and the texture goes from zero to one. So we need to kind of shift the dot product's output. We just kind of need to like kick it in the butt and move it over to zero to one. And then we can, um, we can use it for the, this texture. So what you can see here is that we're just taking the dot product like normal, multiplying it by 0.5, adding uh, 0.5. Just trust me, this, this adds up to it moves the dot product from negative one to one over to zero to one. And then now that it's in that, that's, that's what that all does, uh, and this. And now that it's doing that, what we're doing is we're feeding the UV value of this texture. So we're actually using the dot product to pick a place on the UV. So now we can read this texture. We can read it and say like, oh, at this value, do this, okay? So now we'll create a, uh, a little texture. Uh, asset and I think we probably want that to be a property because people can use that so let's get rid of these ones we don't need them anymore and instead we'll create another little texture and we'll call this you know the light light ramp that makes sense makes sense to me okay and then I've created a couple sample ones but light ramps basically look like this they tell you what it looks like from the shadow to the light and then you can draw how many steps you want so if you want three bands of light fine if you want 10, fine. And if you want the bands to be blendy in one area, but not blendy or very sharp in another area, you can control that precisely in your texture. And so this doesn't describe the texture or the color. It just describes the shade or the, the, the light. So as you go from left to right, you go from the shadow to the, to the bright areas of the object. So let's just pick this one. So, and you can also choose the ranges individually. So this one has like a thin band in between the white. So I'll grab that one, and now you can see that this is starting to get those bands already. So now 
we're getting close because instead of um, having to deal with all these steps and math and stuff that's annoying, we get to deal with just textures, which is way easier to deal with. And then, you, you know, you can just pass that to someone uh, that you want to give creative control to. So now we're getting the, the, uh, the bands based on a texture out of this dot product. And then we're multiplying it by the texture that we just want, the texture that has the, the main information of if it's a soccer ball or whatever on that object. So now if we pop over here, we're actually going to start to see something that's starting to look like a tune shader. So oops, there was this guy. Um, so we can rotate the ball like we'd expect. And by the way, this, this is not a texture intended for this ball. So don't. Yeah, I know it looks like garbage, but um, we're just looking at the lighting here. So we can rotate the texture, but then you can actually see that the lighting is, is being controlled in that banding. So this is very cool. It's getting close to where we want to go, but there's still a couple of problems. One is that it's too dark on the dark side because it goes to full black. Um, and then the other one is that we don't have that nice little specular highlight. It's still, the specular highlight is still this very dull thing. So we have to kind of turn that spec highlight into a tune shader thing too. <clears throat> um, so if we grab this guy, we're going to um, come down here. Now, we didn't get to play with this, but yeah. So if you have this light texture here, and um, oh, I don't know why it has that texture too. Yeah, we just need the uh, light ramp. Did I hook it up or did I? No, of course I didn't. So here's the light ramp. Boing. OK, so that's the one we actually made. And save. Okay, cool. So now we have our light ramp and now I can pick the light ramp. So what's cool about this is just by changing the texture, we can change how the light works on our objects. And you can have mini bands, one band, no bands. And even actually, it, since we're just multiplying this into the, um, into the texture, you could have one band that adds some blue to the, to the light. So you can, this is controlling the light so it doesn't have to be black to white. You could actually have it be something that totally changes what the light does. Um, and this is not changing the texture, it's adding to it via light. So this will be controlled by the light direction and so on. So this is really cool because we're kind of hacking into Unity's light system and using that to uh, modify how it interacts with our objects. So you can create cool effects, you can create inverse lighting on certain objects, or you can create a ghosting effects or other things just by modifying sort of how the light multiplies with this. So that's kind of cool, but I'll just use a, uh, a simple one like we had. Okay, so now that we have basic light and basic tune shading, uh, the next thing to do is to get rid of this really dark, ugly black. So the important, and you can kind of see that on these other ones, they're nice and uh, lightened up down here. And how to do that is we could just like make up a value and multiply it like that, but Unity is already giving us a ton of information. So wherever possible, I like to use that. And Unity already has ambient light. There's ambient light settings in your scene. So what we're going to do is it's just the same thing. Little piece by little piece, we're going to see if what we have. Oh, look, there it is. So we have ambient light. And you can see that ambient light node gives us the color, the sky color. It also gives us these other ones, but we don't need those. So we'll just say, OK, this is cool. We need to add some light. So we're going to take this light here. And we're going to take the, our light that we have down below, right? So now we have our ambient light mixed with the light that we're generating. And then now we can multiply that against our texture, OK? So now we have our texture, but do you see it doesn't go to full dark anymore? All we did is add the ambient light. So like these nodes confuse me for a little bit because it's the opposite of math. If you're typing an equation, it's the opposite order. So when you create a node, it's typically in the in the reverse order of what you would do it if you were typing it out as an equation. Because usually you write like, you know, the power of something and then you put brackets and then you put what you're adding before there. This is the opposite. You feed the inputs in, which are those things in the brackets, and then you get the result out and then you use that to plug somewhere. So anyway, all we do is we take the ambient, we add it, and then we take the result of that and we, we do what we just did before. So we're just building a little bit by little bit. So now once we save that, um, we see a far more pleasing result because we can see those 
uh, the texture in those shadow areas. And the other thing that's really great about this is that it actually responds to um, the lighting in Unity. Uh, actually, I don't want to bake that right now. So yeah, it does though. Um, if you change the skybox material, if you use a uh, um, you know Unity's um, settings in here to do anything with the ambient light, that'll be reflected in here, which is really cool um, because that means if you apply this texture to or material to multiple objects, um, they'll all react to that same environment in the same way. So that's neat. So now we have a, uh, a you know almost there on the tune shader. There's a couple things that we would like to do. One is this little spec, the little highlight thing that you see a lot in Breath of the Wild and stuff. We get a nice sharp highlight, and that once you have an object that has a lot of geometry on it, you know, that highlight starts to give you a lot of information about what that object looks like, right? So, um, so the first thing is, let's do the highlight. And honestly, this is usually how I approach all shaders, which is just like one piece, and then one piece, and then one piece, and then one piece, and you just keep hooking it up. Um, and it tends to go pretty well that way. So here's the thing, we already have the light, but what we need to do is we need to sharpen that up. So if we uh, take a look here at this thing that looked really complicated at the beginning, but it's getting less and less complicated, right? We're, we're making all these pieces. We made that piece, we made this piece, made this piece. Um, there's the rim light over there. Um, so what we wanna do for the highlight is um, we want to actually think about the view direction. So what is important with the highlight is we need to know the light direction that's up here, we already have that in our calculations. But this time we actually also need the view direction from the camera where you're looking from because that's, you know, that's how you see what reflected into your eye and that's where you get those little highlights. So you don't get a highlight if you're not looking, right? Um, so you have to be looking there and then when you change how you're looking, the, where that highlight is will change. So we need to get that. So that's from the view direction, but we actually have, have that. So we're gonna actually just grab all that. So this one's pretty simple, but I'll just break it down. But basically, we'll pop down here to give ourselves some space. And what we're gonna do is we're going to create a view direction node. And then um, I'm normalizing that, but just to make sure, sometimes I over normalize. I just wanna make sure that it goes to one. This probably already does, but I wanna make sure that it does. So I'm just normalizing it to make sure that we're always in that range because all we care about is the direction. We don't care about the vector of like how far it goes. We don't care. We just want the direction. So we'll take that and then we're going to add that. Um, we're going to add that to our light direction. So we're in this case, we're actually adding them the two together. So we had our light up here and we're going to grab the light direction. And we're going to scroll all the way down here. That's slow. That's slow. All right. So we're going to add those together. So now we have the, the two directions being added together. We're going to normalize that. And then we're going to take, again, the, uh, the normal vector from the object. And then we're going to get the dot product of that. So all I'm saying is I'm saying I have the object. I know where its surface is. That's what this, this is, the normals of the object. So we did this before to get the surface. This time we're just doing it again and we're saying this time add the, um, the view to it because the view matters too. So we're, it's actually exactly what we did to calculate the light and shadow, only this time we're saying add the view to it because where you're looking at the object from matters. So we'll add that together, do the exact same thing, get the dot product of that. Then we're going to multiply that with a, um, you know, however strong you want that highlight to be. So some people call that glossiness. Um, some people call that um, whatever, <laughs> shininess, I guess, whatever you want to call that. But we're going to add uh, something where we can say, like, we want it to be really, really shiny or we want it to not be that shiny, um, that kind of thing. So, um, so that's fine. So I'm going to multiply it by our texture, too, because if our texture has um, something in it that doesn't that's dark and it shouldn't get a shine then I can snip it out with that so anyway so here's our um, our vector one so we're going to need something here uh, so I'll call it shininess 
because that's probably not a word and that that's fun. Okay, so we have our, our shininess thing and we can take that and we can plug it into here. So this is a power um, math thing and power just, you know, ramps it up really fast. So the power just makes it, you know, exponential really quick. So it just makes it sharp. We, you could just multiply it, but that would just take forever. So just use power because you'll just get a really sharp point. So now we're going to control how sharp that is with the shininess. And then we're going to, um, you don't have to do this, but um, I'm just smoothing it out a little bit. So we, we used that smooth step before to control our shade. And then we threw it away because we had a better way of using a ramp. But with a specular highlight, it's just one spec, so we don't really need to control it with a texture. So this time we can just use the smooth step, and we can just say, you'll get the shiny little point, and then the smooth step just will take like the edge of that shiny point and just kind of blur it a little bit, blend it out a little bit. So it's not too sharp. Um, so that's all I'm doing there. And um, I'm using a little trick here. So if you look at these uh, vector ones, that's basically just like, that means like a number, only if you click here, there is no just a number, you know, like a float value, like just a number or a decimal. They don't have that. They, they just have vector one, two, three, four. So vector one is basically just one number. So you can always use a vector one as one number. But since we need two numbers for a smooth step and creating two vector ones is kind of lame, why not just create one vector two? So you can just create one vector two and you can call this specular smoothiness and <laughs> and then I actually get both my values right here so now that I have both my values I'll just say like okay well let's it's going to be super you know small let's put it like 0 0.01 and then 0 0.02 I and mean, even that might be too big but we'll find out so I'm going to take my specular smoothiness and then what I can do is because it's a vector 2 I need to split them up, so I'll use a split node, which exists. And then I split them up, and then I'll just use the first one for the first value and the second one for the second value. So this is just a shortcut. It's a cheat. You could have created two properties and controlled them, but this is just a little bit easier, and I think it'll make a little bit more sense for the user because when you look at this in the editor, now instead of like two values where, where you're a little bit confused, you'll see specular smoothness with those values there. You punch them in. And then there's our shininess. So we'll be able to control our shininess here, and then our specular smoothness will control here, or our shininess smoothness, I guess I could have called it. Um, okay, but the last thing is we need, we need to hook that up back into our main pile of stuff here. So even though we have all these extra things, we have the output right here, and that's not hooked up to anything. So the last thing to do is, like usual, grab one more node and take all this and take all this and combine it together. So Usually when I'm adding those two things together and I'm thinking about light, it's either going to be a multiply node or an add node. And it just depends on if you want additive light or if it's a shadow, for, for instance, and you want it to, or a texture, for instance, and you want it to be multiplied in. So if it's going to be dar darkening the thing or making it brighter, essentially, right? So you can see um, in this one, we just multiplied it and then added it because I, what did I multiply it by? I multiplied it by uh, the color, but who cares about that? So we're just going to add this. We're going to use an add node because this is light, so we want to add it on. So let's add the stuff that we've already made with our little specular highlight, and then let's pop that into our mission. Boing. Okay, and then let's save it like usual. Okay, and then let's see if we did it right. So now we have a very, very specular highlight. Uh, um, this is giant goose egg. So we need to play with our values. So let's take our shininess and, and turn it way, way up. There you go. Now we have a nice crisp point on here, but you'll see that it won't fall into the shadows um, because it's only going to happen on those bright points. So that's really cool because on a soccer ball, that looks like a dot. So it's like or like, you know, maybe it's like an eyeball. It looks like a nice specular dot. But on an object like this, it starts to matter a lot more when you have like a character or a complex object because those specular highlights give you a lot of information about the shape. So if we take our, um, if we take our whoop, texture that we made, or our material that we made, which should be cell, there it is. 
sell um, material. Here you go. So sell uh, demo cell. Okay. All right. So if we do demo cell, actually, let's do this because that's the soccer ball one. We'll make another one. We'll call it demo robo. Demo robo cell. I'm typing like a wizard right now. Which is to say I'm typing really bad right now. Um, okay. And then we're going to use the robot texture. So we're using the shader we just made, but we're putting that robot's texture back on him. Now you can see that that shiny point that didn't that didn't seem that oppressive on the uh, on a sphere is a lot more useful here because we're getting a lot more lighting information um, by looking at this guy. And the other thing that's cool is if I take the light and rotate it, you know um, that specularity is only going to happen in those nice, you know, bright points. So this is starting to look actually a lot more like kind of a Breath of the Wild shader now. Um, and there's still more we can do with it. But I would say even if you got this far, first of all, congratulations for staying awake. Uh, it's the middle of the week in the evening and this is a little dry. <laughs> uh, but second of all, if you got this far, I think this is actually like a really useful uh, shader already. You could use this one shader to create a whole game, you know, and just changing the textures. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and I am recording this. Hope if if it if the recording works, <laughs> then I will give it to Dylan so everyone can have it. I also will, uh, you know, put the project up so you know, um, or put the shader up. But. Um, but basically, if you get that far, that's pretty good because you could actually make a whole world with this. Um, but, um, and in fact, you could make this world. Uh, I made, I, if you get this far, then I made a little scene getting this far. And this is just a tiny little room scene, a very simple scene um, that just uses uh, one shader with a couple of different textures to create a, um, you know, it's like a little living room, nothing fancy. And um, if you see you know, Breath of the Wild and stuff, those are usually outdoor scenes, which look pretty nice. But if you look at this scene, that's just that cell shader with some textures. So uh, the other thing is uh, I put a little bit of bloom on here, which totally works um, with the shader. So um, that is, uh, that's already looking pretty good and, and it doesn't take much effort to get that far. But the cool thing about this is you could actually take it quite a bit farther because um, you know there's things that uh, you may want like an outline. There's things that you may want like um, backlighting. Uh, there's things that you may want um, like normal mapping. And all of those things can actually be built into this shader. Uh, but do you have time or energy for any of those things? <laughs> Not tonight. Yeah, exactly. So I'll wrap it up with one more because it, it is cool and it's actually not as hard as you think, um, which is backlighting. And this is actually the exact same thing. If you wanted to make more like a Dragon Ball Z shader where it's more, it looks like it's drawn and it has an outline as well as this tune shading um, to create that outline, but also to create backlighting. It's actually the exact same process um, with a little tweak at the end. So I'll show you backlighting and, and you can um, modify that to do outlining as well. But basically how this works is um, this top section up here that seems scary before um, is actually where we'll add this in. And it's pretty simple, but basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a Fresnel effect, which they already have built in. So we could create this by getting the light and then inverting it since we're already getting the light. So we could do that, but since they've already created this, um, why not? So if you look at this, um, the Fresnel effect, the Fresnel is basically just as you go to the edge of an object, it gets uh, it gets brighter or it gets more opaque. So you can see that effect here, the white being opaque. So you can see that all we need to do here is punch in the value in X. So if I, the higher I go, the, the sharper that edge goes. So that's really cool. So this looks like something that should be a value here. So we'll just call this rim light, uh, rim light strength, cool. And then we'll put it at something like seven or eight or whatever and pop it in there. So now we have a rim light and um, it's pretty simple. Now we can already just take this and we can use either one of our multiply nodes or our add nodes. In this case, cause it's light, we wanna add it, right? We don't want it to get darker, we want it to get brighter. 
So if I just take all the light we've gone, gotten so far and add this uh, glowing edge to it, and then I pop that into our thing, so that was really not that hard, and we got that effect of like a glowing rim light. Um, and now if you look at one, look at our guy there. So now you'll see he has, uh, as well as his tune shading, he's got this glowing border. But the border isn't very tuny because the border is all soft gradients and the tune shader is all about hard gradients. So the last thing to do to just make this uh, simple um, is, and I think it's, it's starting to get a little clear, right? Like there's only a couple techniques we're using. We're using that ramp is kind of a neat one, but mostly we're just using these step functions. So we'll do the smooth step again. Great. And um, we can even do this, the exact same specular smoothness here because I'm just cheating at this point. Um, so I'll split it out. So I'll type split node. So why not just reuse variables, right? The less variables, the better. So, and then we'll say that one goes to that one. That one goes to that one. Great. And then we're going to take the input from the front of the effect. And now check it out. So we're using that same thing with the smooth step. So we're just giving it a little bit of a blur at the edge because we don't want it to be too sharp. Um, but we want it to be obviously a lot sharper than it was. So now that we've got that smooth step, now we can add that to the thing. And now check it out. Um, we have an outline for our object. So now our objects will have outlines. And um, if you want to adjust how thick the outlines are, all you have to do is adjust this rim light strength. Or I mean, you could just rename it and call it outline thickness, right? Um, and so now we have uh, an object with an outline. Um, and the only bummer now, and the last thing we'll do for tonight is the only bummer now is like, this outline's always white, right? Uh, and so that's not the greatest. So how do we change that? So there's a couple ways. You could obviously just say plus here and you could say color and then you could call this outline color and then you could pick a color. So if you want it to always be like dark blue or purpley blue, then you could do that. So you could bring this color in and you could say before adding that light, you could multiply it by this color. So color is not really an add, color is a multiply. So if I take this color and I multiply it by that smooth step, then check it out. Now we got a purple outline, right? So now we can take that and add that to our object. And now we'll get our purple outline in additive light, right? So now you can see we've got our guy. We actually have this interesting purple outline um, and it's in additive light. So you can see a little bit about what's behind it. If you don't want it to be an additive light, just change that add node to a multiply and it'll be a dark outline and it'll be a lot more visible. But um, that's uh, that's how you can start. And so yeah, it'll look a lot more like an outline if you change it to a multiply. But anyway, so that's how you would create an outline, but also how you would create a rim light. Um, and uh, if you want the rim light to only appear on the light, the lit side and not in the shadow, then all you have to do is multiply it here. So before you add it, um, so here we go, we'll just multiply it here instead. So we'll take the rim light, multiply it by our output of the lighting, and now you can actually see this guy here is the um, just the lit side uh, because we've multiplied it by there. And then you could multiply that by your color if you wanted to color it. You don't have to color it, but if you wanted to color it, you can multiply it by that, and then you could cook that up. But you could also just put that directly um, into your final output and not even deal with the color, and then this would just get lit um, the color of whatever the object is, which is cool too. So anyway, there's a bunch of ways you can play with that. Um, that's probably all we have time for now or brain power. But, um, but the cool thing is, is that the more you kind of dive into this and the more you kind of like take it just a little piece of it at a time and so you don't have to worry about it too much, um, you know, instead of thinking about it as being too scary, just taking it a little piece at a time, the more you can, you know, make effects that like are your own and, um, and you don't get out of the box and you can kind of create, I don't know, you can get 
pretty far by just adding a little piece at a time is what I'm trying to say, I guess.